I've uh, <clears throat> been doing a lot of reading recently in preparation for um, uh, coming publication. <coughs> um, some things have been helpful uh, along the way and, and some of the things I do. Uh, it started out with <coughs> Ariel Roth years ago making me read some books by, on philosophy of science by people who understood both the the strengths and the limits of science and anyway. So we're talking about epigenetics. <coughs> it's not really a, a new field but yet um, in, in recent years, the last few years, it's really come into much more prominence. I guess partly because of expanding uh, research abilities in, in uh, genetics and molecular biology. <coughs> so what is epigenetics? For those of you who are not <coughs> familiar with it, it's uh, it means beyond the genes or outside of the genes. It's uh, genetic mechanisms that are not genetic information, not coming from the genes. We had a lecture here years ago by, by by Jonathan Wells, and he was talking about about this idea that we're going to be there's going to we're going to find that there's a lot of genetic thing process our inheritance is not from the genes. And I thought he was getting a little far out, but um, turns out he he wasn't far out at all. <coughs> Maybe you have the lights. Um, some of the books on epigenetics use Audrey Hepburn as an example. <clears throat> she was this uh, kind of delicate, petite beauty, a delicate bone structure. Um, but this, this all came at a price, a considerable price, not willingly, not a willing price. In 1944 or 45, um, was uh, the, the people in Europe had been through already four years of war, and that winter came as a very brutal winter, and uh, it, it had a, there was another problem for the Dutch, and that is that the the Nazis took revenge on the on the uncooperative Dutch by blockading their country, not allowing food or other things to come in for several months for the main part of this winter, and th the result was quite severe. Over 20,000 people just starved to death. The rest of them lived on like 30% of the nutrition needed. They were eating everything they could get a hold of, including little bulb, little, you know, their flowers they grow, they eat the bulbs and other things. Okay, she, Audrey Hepburn was a teenager during that time. <clears throat> it had a big effect on her. She remained small, uh, delicate. She was in poor health all her life uh, because of that. And so why, once, once the famine is over, why didn't her health improve? Well, we'll get to the answer here in the next few slides. <clears throat> but it, it didn't. She struggled with some things. Some other things happened during this uh, Dutch famine. Uh, there were a number of, of births, of course, women who were pregnant during this time. And if the, if the famine came in the early months of their pregnancy, the baby was likely to have normal birth weight um, a higher rate of obesity later in life and certain other health problems. If, uh, if the famine came late in your pregnancy, the baby would likely to have low birth weight and a, a low rate of obesity, you know, that's good, but they never recovered from some other uh, effects on their health. <clears throat> and some of these effects carried over to the next generation. So there's something uh, sort of persistent going on here. And this is the important factor here in, in epigenetics. Genetic changes have persisted to at least the next generation. Now, to step back a bit and give some, some uh, background history here, when, when DNA was discovered in the 50s, this, this concept became, uh, uh, pr was proposed and became uh, established. DNA makes RNA, which makes protein. That's the way it goes. It never goes the other way. Uh, this became to be known as the central dogma of molecular biology. Now, science is not supposed to, you know, have dogma, but anyway, that's what it was called. Um, <clears throat> sometimes I tell my students, half of what we teach you is wrong. The only problem is we don't know which half. We have to wait and see what discoveries are made to know. Well, this is one of the, one, part of that half. This is clearly wrong, and how, just how wrong is becoming better and better understood. Um, it goes, <coughs> it doesn't just go uh, this way, it also goes the other way. Some, some significant findings um, in molecular biology in recent years. No junk DNA. 
junk DNA has been a, a stable, staple part of, of evolution uh, understanding uh, for, for a long time. But there became to be more and more evidence that some of that junk was actually important regulatory genes. And this came to a head finally with the ENCODE project completion in September 2012. Now instead of 98% uh, of the human genome being junk, it's now uh, known to be pretty much regulatory genes. These control how, when, and where proteins will be made. Um, <coughs> and epigenetics is, uh, is, is this process where you have additional layers of control outside of the genes uh, that manage and control how the DNA I is expressed. And this is a complex of uh, RNA proteins and hormones, and for the whole body, it's the, the CNS is involved in all of this uh, control. And it really becomes interesting when we uh, when we consider <coughs> uh, the, the next step. Uh, the DNA is like a hard drive. That's a lot of information, massive amounts of information. But uh, the DNA by itself cannot do anything. Um, I think this is, was, has been evident, but yet how evident is, is much more understood. Um, the, the epigenetic system reads that information and manages how it's used. Um, so <coughs> also the epigenetic system does not blindly apply that DNA information because our bodies and our cells have sensors, lots of sensors that detect the environment. Um, the cells detect the chemical environment around, but our, our whole being detects our environment. And the epigenetic system uses that information to decide. And this, I put this decide in quotes. It, it's a contentious concept here. But yet uh, molecular biologists who work directly with this, they insist, yes, this is what's happening. The cell decides how to use uh, the, the DNA, how to use the information in DNA, how to interpret it. And it, get, it begins with the environmental information um, along with all the other information that it has, and that uses this to decide um, how to apply um, the DNA. <coughs> in terms of the actual physical mechanism, there are various things happening, um, but the, the epigenetic system puts these chemical tags on the DNA. If you, in this picture uh, of a, a, a DNA strand, you see some little pink structures right here. Okay, that would be methyl groups, so you're, this is called methylation, where you put these methyl groups uh, on the DNA, and that um, turns genes on or off, uh, or works as a dimmer switch to, re to reduce their effect. And so this is controlling uh, what's going to happen with that information in DNA. <coughs> and of course, there have to be layers of control that determine the location of those tags. And it's a very complicated process, and we will not go into all the details, but just into the implications here of what's actually happening. And so you have changes in the body, uh, which is not from a change in the DNA. The DNA is, is the same, but uh, there are changes in physiology, anatomy, or behavior because of the epigenetic control of what happens uh, with the DNA. <coughs> so. These non-genetic changes then can remain for a lifetime, so we come to Audrey Hepburn. Why did she not get healthier after the famine is over? Well, apparently there were these epigenetic changes now which affected her uh, through her life. And these changes can be inherited uh, for, for several generations or even many generations. <coughs> they can also be reversed. If the conditions change, those, those uh, changes can, can reverse. And if a woman is, is pregnant, pregnant, <coughs> various factors uh, like stress or nutritional factors and uh, other things affect the children. Um, and this can be inherited for several generations. Now maybe this reminds you of a, of a Bible verse, punishing the children for the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. Now we used to wonder, well, what does that mean? Well, now we know something about what it means. Um, these epigenetic changes can in fact last for several generations and then can revert back if the conditions are right. Uh, here's an article that was published in, the, in this prestigious journal, Nature, uh, last year. It, the title was Epigenetics, The Sins of the Father. Okay, so here it is right there in, in Nature. <coughs> 
with this picture. <laughs> that, that was, I was quite amused by seeing this in the, the journal Nature. <clears throat> but it, it's recognizing this, what's happening here. You're, you're having changes that occur and, and persist for a little while, for a few generations, and then they can change back again. This article gave a, a good example, <coughs> an experiment that, that showed that this is real. These kind of things do happen. Uh, in this experiment, they, they took mice, exposed them to the odor of acetophenol. Now, that's not a, a, a noxious, awful odor that would really affect them. It's just kind of a mild, um, I guess, kind of a sweet odor. So it's not the, it's, the result here is not because of the odor itself. But when they were exposed to this odor, they were given a mild shock to their foot. Okay, this was done several times a day for three days. Now that's not very, a, a very drastic um, sort of thing you're doing to these mice. Just for three days, they experienced this. Okay, then they were, these were males, so they were mated with, with females who had never been exposed to that odor. <coughs> and the offspring gave the same response. They were sensitive to that odor and they would they would be startled by sounds that they heard when they were smelling that odor. And uh, there was also a physical effect. They, these odor sensitive neurons uh, connected with the olfactory bulbs were enlarged, uh, related to this response apparently. And this, this persisted uh, for several generations. So it wasn't just um, a, a temporary thing. Persisted for three generations. Okay, that's what we're talking about here. You have these changes and that this is not a mutation. The genes have not changed. This is just this epigenetic control of the DNA and it persists um, for several generations. <coughs> Another one. You have pregnant laboratory mice. They were given a dose of this uh, fungicide, vin vincozolin. <coughs> okay, the male offspring um, had testicular defects and a reduced fertility. And uh, it was not just the offspring, but without further exposure to that fungicide, this effect persisted for at least four generations. And again, there's no change in the DNA. These are not mutations. This is just the epigenetic management uh, of the DNA and of the animal's uh, characteristics. <coughs> the sins of the father to the third and fourth generation. In, in our body, there are, there are many different cell types. And yet, and I was reading an article the other day that, um, that has to qualify this next sentence a little bit. But anyway, generally, these different cell types have, uh, have the same genes. The DNA is, is basically the same. The difference is epigenetic. These ta this tagging, and it controls uh, what, the, um, what the genes are going to do. So epigenetics, is a very fascinating field that's just blossoming in, in what they're finding about all these effects that come about by the management of the DNA. <coughs> well, I want to talk then about what are the implications for evolution. Um, and it does have definite implications. <coughs> Little background information. Um, Darwin's theory, of course, had uh, pr proposed these ideas of, of evolutionary change. But Darwin and his colleagues knew nothing, absolutely nothing about molecular biology. Uh, that was far in the future yet. Okay, so <clears throat> his theory was, was quite primitive in many ways in terms of, of a mechanism. But later on then, during the 1930s and 40s, uh, there was a group of um, geneticists and paleontologists and, and others who put together a, a synthesis, putting all of this together into a, a, a theory that was utilizing the, the additional information available at that time. Um, <coughs> and in, in this, well, this theory, it, it had a lot to do with um, population genetics. It was, it was much of it was mathematical, um, you know, theorizing not much real world data going into it, uh, mostly theoretical. But anyway, it, it's, it has persisted. It is still thought by, by traditional Darwinists to be the, the theory uh, that tells us about evolution. <coughs> and of course, this theory is strictly uh, naturalistic. 
No creators are allowed. Um, no intelligent design is allowed. And in this system, all new genetic information must arise by random, undirected processes. The meaning, the process that makes these mutations does not know the needs of the animal. Mutations do not occur, occur because the animal needs them. Uh, the mutations occur without any a relationship to whether or not it will be good. And then it's a natural selection get, that gets rid of the, the destructive mutations. So natural selection um, cannot do anything by itself. It can only say yes or no, in a sense, to the, to the random changes that have happened. So natural selection cannot make anything. It, ha it can only respond to the, the changes that have happened by chance, randomly. <coughs> this is a, uh, uh, has to be for, uh, for naturalistic Darwinian theory to, to occur. Must be random in relation to the needs of the organism. Naturalism cannot accept any genetic foresight, any looking ahead to see what's going to be needed, or, or a response. It cannot have a response to the environment, um, or the environment um, can manages or influences what mutations occur. Now that, that idea is called Lamarckianism. Lamarck had this theory that, that um, the, in, the environment can influence the animal, the animal changes, and those acquired changes are inherited. Now Darwin um, actually had some of that in his own theory. He, he didn't totally um, uh, reject that. But it, it's that idea of inheritance of acquired characteristics is anathema to, to modern Darwinian theory, neo-Darwinian Darwinism. <coughs> the environment cannot affect what changes happen, what mutations happen. That would look like foresight, like somebody or something knows what's going to be needed. Okay, so that's a very important aspect of, uh, of Darwinian theory, neo-Darwinian um, theory. But epigenetics has significant impact on this requirement of randomness. And this is where epigenetics becomes important in understanding uh, the theory of evolution. <coughs> Some examples. Uh, blind cave fish. Okay, I've, I've, this is one of these things I've taught, you know, baloney for years. I've taught my students that uh, these fish and uh, crayfish and, well, um, uh, crickets or whatever moves into caves. It's dark. And so if mutations occur that damage the eyes, there's, there's natural selection won't get rid of those mutations because it's okay if they're blind. In fact, they're better off if their body doesn't have to put the energy into making eyes. Okay, so it's mutation, random mutations then are making them blind. Well, that's not true. Now, this has been found by experiment. These, there are no mutations. The eye genes are intact. The, there's no damage to the eye genes. Epigenetic changes have turned off the eyes. Uh, exactly how this happens, I don't think anybody knows for sure, but the environment has influenced what is, uh, what is happening. <coughs> this is another fascinating um, case. Here we, salamanders. We don't have a lot of salamanders around here. It's too dry, but uh, many parts of the country there are plenty of salamanders, and there are different types of salamander life cycles. Uh, this this represents a species that lives in the water uh, all of its life. It has external gills. It has fins on its tail for swimming. Okay, and they, they persist throughout life. <coughs> there are other species that, that, um, that live, they begin in the water, they're hatched out in the water, they live in the water for part of their life cycle. Then they move on to land and they live on land. They lose their gills and they lose the fin uh, on their tail. Okay, so they're adjusting to life on land. <coughs> there are other species that never, that never live in the water. They live only on land. They have to have moist conditions to lay their eggs. But the, the little embryo in the egg has, has uh, external gills and a tail fin. They lose that before the egg hatches. Okay, so 
This is a, a neat example then of, of evolution. It's portrayed that way um, because you have, um, you know, these things have mutated to, to uh, adjust to their where they live, and this is a, a vestige. It doesn't need those gills, but it still has them. Uh, but then they lose them before they hatch. So that's an evolutionary vestige. <coughs> okay, uh, people, uh, yeah, have, experiments have been done that show now that this is not really quite the case. The genes are not different. These, these are not mutational differences. This is epigenetic different difference, epigenetic differences between these different species. And, <coughs> uh, Depending on the life cycle, the epigenetic factors control when they have these, uh, these gills. And so let me just suggest a scenario here to explain this. Um, so why, the question still remains, why they have these vestigial gills? Well, let me suggest that God made salamanders with potential for a variety of life cycles. And he gave them a genetic mechanism to adjust. Okay. Is when they have these gills, those salamanders have the ability to move into a different environment. Say the, the environment gets too dry and it just can't cope with it. Well, they have the possibility of now moving into a more aquatic life cycle. So they're made to adjust to the environment that they live in. And they have that capacity uh, to adjust. <coughs> um, give another example here uh, to go along with this. You know, fossil horses, you have a series of fossil horses from small to large. Uh, the, the, the small ones have several toes. The, the, uh, the big modern horses have just one toe. The hoof uh, surrounds the, the middle toe, and that's what they walk on. Okay, <coughs> okay are those, um, did they by mutation lose those toes in the course of evolution? Well, some horses are still born with extra toes. The genes are still there. Uh, and I don't know that this has been experimentally studied, but I'd suggest that this is a, another case where animals are made with the, the possibility of epigenetic modifications to adjust to different, different uh, places of living. The, um, the fossils would indicate the time of those little horses with several toes. The habitat was much more uh, forested. And, uh, you know, a fast running one-toed horse doesn't do so well in a, in a forest. The environment apparently changed. I would suggest after the flood, the environment changes, becomes more open grassland, and now they adapt. Um, epigenetic modification changes them. That's just a, you know, I don't know if that's true, but it's a possibility. Another possible example of epigenetic modifications. Galapagos finches. We've all heard, uh, no doubt, about evolution of the Galapagos finches and, and, and how you get all these different species. Well. You know, part of that certainly happened, <coughs> but exactly what was going on there? Uh, there have been some famous experiments showing that Galapagos finches' bill sizes change according to um, the, 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 the climate, which affects the size of seeds available. And this was thought of as being, again, mutational change. Uh, mutational change and natural selection, uh, eliminating those that don't, don't fit. And so you have the bills, climate changes, the bills get bigger, uh, climate changes back and the bills get smaller. Well, now it's understood that these are, there's, there's no mutational changes here. These again are just epigenetic. The epigenetic system modifying how the DNA is used. <coughs> One other interesting example um, is an aquatic plant that lives in the water, but it, it extends up above the water as well. And the leaves are, are rather different under the water from the leaves that are above the water. Well, this is, again has been studied, and that's an epigenetic factor. Um, the environment of, a, of that part of the stem um, induces these, these epigenetic changes in how the DNA is, is interpreted, and it changes the leaf shape, depending on whether that part of the stem is, is underwater or is above water. <coughs> the environment is affecting these changes. <coughs> Okay, epi implications then for evolution. These epigenetic modifications have several characteristics. They are heritable, they can be inherited. 
Um, they are beneficial changes occurring initiated by our environmental influence. Okay, this is, I would say this implies genetic foresight, not on the part of some person who's modifying them as they go along, but the genetic system has foresight. Um, the environment can initiate beneficial changes which are inherited. This is like Lamarckianism, inheritance of acquired beneficial characters. And that's a worrisome problem for Darwinian theory. Uh, <clears throat> any kind of a naturalistic theory, you cannot have this foresight. It, that just is not possible. Okay, so how do evolutionary biologists deal with it? Um, about 15 years ago, I was at a meeting of the, of the Society of Vertebrate Paleontologists, and there was a, uh, an eminent member of that group <coughs> giving a talk on, on the theory, uh, uh, you know, the molecular aspects, the details of the theory. And he, he made this statement. He said, um, the, the, the neo-Darwinian synthesis needs to be redone. And he said, this time we're not going to blow it. Okay, I, I heard that, and I wonder, what is he talking about? What does he know that, that I haven't heard? <laughs> well, in recent years now, it's becoming more evident what he was talking about. He, he realized the neo-Darwinian theory doesn't work. Um, and epigenetics is giving some explanations as to what's wrong with it. <clears throat> so I wondered how this is being dealt with by, by evolutionary scientists, the prominent ones who write the textbooks. So I go on Google and I ask for evolution textbooks. And there's, there's about a half a dozen that are, uh, the, there might be some other ones, but these are the main ones. <coughs> there's a book here of evolutionary readings, a collection of readings. The others are, are just evolutionary textbooks. Um, and so I looked for what they do with epigenetics. And the, these are all the latest editions uh, from 2004 to 2014. Uh, these, these four never mention the term. Nothing is said about epigenetics. Um, this one has, has one sentence, one non-committal non sentence about, ep about epigenetics. This one has maybe half a page. This one has maybe a page and a half. But in both cases, um, th they assure the readers that it does not have any permanent effects and it is not uh, inheritance of acquired characters. So they uh, assure the faithful that we're still on the right track. They're, they're simply not dealing with it, is what it amounts to. And there are some other prominent authors who, who say that frankly. That, um, evolutionary biologists are ignoring several decades of molecular biology research. <coughs> now there's another category of text. These few, these few books, uh, these are by, by scientists who, who understand epigenetics and it, understand it, the reality of it. And they are, in fact, um, using these to try to develop an, a new synthesis of evolution. Uh, evolution, the extended synthesis, and this is what they're talking about. They're, they're basing their new synthesis, which to them replaces the neo-Darwinian synthesis. Their synthesis uses um, epigenetics as its base. This is a fascinating book, just full of examples. Um, uh, of uh, how epigenetics is important in any whatever changes occur. This book I find very fascinating, um, Evolution of View from the 21st Century by James Shapiro. He's a molecular biologist, an eminent molecular biologist. Clearly, all these guys clearly are not creationists. They believe that life came about by evolution. They are naturalistic uh, thinkers. But they realize the neo-Darwinian synthesis doesn't work. And epigenetics is a reality. This person, well, I'll give you some quotes from him. Um, he has a very fascinating view. He, um, he mentions that he, he feels he's been benefited by having studied under Barbara McClintock and, her, and learning philosophical approaches from her. She encouraged her students, don't depend on, on um, assumptions, on uh, presuppositions. Just take your data and, and see where it leads. And he's been willing to do that, even though it, it puts him in positions where he simply says, how this all evolved is a mystery. How life came about is a mystery. He's willing to be frank 
and candid about those things. <coughs> um, here's one of Shapiro's statements. A major assertion of many traditional thinkers about evolution and mutation is that living cells cannot make specific adaptive use of their natural genetic engineering capacities. He refers to this ability of the cell to manage the DNA as natural genetic engineering. They make this assertion to protect their view of evolution as the product of random undirected genetic changes. So they're, they're protecting their, their belief in these non-directed changes. But their position is philosophical, not scientific, nor is it based on empirical observations. So it's based on their assumption, uh, on their philosophical positions, on their assumption, not on uh, the evidence. <coughs> And the, another book here by uh, Kabej, um, One Century of Studies on Mutations. Okay, he's analyzing whether these, this genetic theory of mutations bringing about adaptive changes. He says, one century of studies on mutations has not provided a single verified example of a gene mutation that led to an adaptive morphological change in metazoans. Okay, it has not worked that the Neo-Darwinian synthesis does not work. And so <coughs> the, these authors point out that the Neo-Darwinian process will modify animals, will modify characters that exist already. We would think of that as microevolution. But the Neo-Darwinian synthesis does not show how to make new, new characters, novel characters like, uh, like feathers. Or a vertebrate skeleton. How do you get how do you get from invertebrates to the vertebrate with our vertebrate skeleton system, which is very complex from fish on, um, <clears throat> and so they want to ex explain how t how you make these novel features, and they're starting from epigenetics. So their theory involves. Um, these environmentally induced mutations, they're accepting those as being real because the evidence just says that that's true. So how do you, and, and they're saying that this epigenetic system, this is how evolution works. This is the evolutionary system. Now how did that system evolve? Because it's vastly more complex now than the old, the old theory of how evolution happens. Uh, how, did, how, does it, how did it come about? Well, Shapiro just says it's a mystery. We don't have a clue. Um, Kabej, he, um, <coughs> he simply says oh, it must have evolved by the early Cambrian. Why? Because you have the same system in all, all the different groups of organisms. So it has to have had to have been there right from the beginning. That's all they have to say. They don't even try to say how it came about. Uh, they refer to this type of inheritance as soft inheritance. That is changes induced by the environment. And they say that this exists and is found in every type of organism and seems to be common. Okay, these, these, this is a chapter in one of those books that I, that I showed you. So that's the basis of their new synthesis. And they, they've, they're working on developing a, a theory, but it's a very speculative theory. And it, it, try, it has to try to downplay this problem, the reality of transmission of acquired characters. And, and like... Um, the one book, the, the, the extended synthesis, they frankly discuss this, that evolutionists generally, and when they say evolutionists, they're in that group, but others have trouble with epigenetics because it does look like Lamarckianism, acquired characters. And so they try to say, well, their theory isn't really inheritance of acquired characters, but they're not very successful in, in making that point, actually. Um, <coughs> And they don't have a solution to the requirement of naturalism. And that is the requirement that all new genetic information must arise by random processes. Random processes that do not know the needs of the organism. Okay, they still have this problem, which they don't really um, even try to, to answer. Uh, here's a little analogy that I, that I made, to, uh, which to me illustrates the nature of the change in thinking. Um, so this is an analogy from an automobile factory. So here you have two machines, one that makes bolts, one that makes pistons. And so uh, here you have the original, this machine has some kind of computer control and it spits out pistons. Then you have a, a mutation. You zap 
this somehow, this computer with, a, uh, with electricity or something, you zap it and you make a change in the instructions. And that makes wider pistons. Um, over here, the bolt machine gets, another, gets zapped by some, something, changes one of the instructions. Uh, in, 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 and uh, mutations, of course, in Darwinian theory, have to come one at a time, basically. You, it has to be small changes at a time. And so you get longer bolts. Okay, that's the system. Well, <coughs> I, I made this after reading that book by Shapiro. And what he says, he says this, the system in the cell we now know is so complex and sophisticated, there's no room in there for these random mutations. Uh, the, 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 the system that will correct those mistakes is so much superior to what we thought it was. It will correct mistakes. And the system manages it, it's, it manages the information. It doesn't just respond to random mutations. It doesn't work, according to him. And so listening to, to what he describes, this is how I see it <coughs> is a better analogy uh, of what's happening. So you have the same machine, but what do you got? You've got your master controller. You've got a whole lot of, of sensors that detect the environment uh, within, within the engine. Uh, the fit in the cylinder, the vibration, the stresses, the temperature, and this is sending information all over to the to the control modules, uh, the control oil mixtures and piston lengths and widths, and then there are stage two controllers which are interacting with these systems. Then you got stage three controllers, and this is all interacting with each other, and you got standby piston specifications. So, if if some change is needed, you got some information now that can be utilized to, to make the change that's needed. <clears throat> and you got a very sophisticated error correction uh, damage repair system. So this is more like what the cell is. It's, it's not a simple, uh, you know, Darwin and his friends thought the cell was a simple little mass of jelly-like stuff and, you know, it can easily evolve. Well, no, it's a bit more complex than that. Some, uh, some further implications, okay? So you've got these, these authors that are trying to develop a new synthesis. Um, they, they recognize that you've got the same epigenetic system in all organisms. There's, there's two serious problems here. Uh, one is that the system itself. How do you get this sophisticated system that has foresight, genetic foresight, that can, can make the changes that will be beneficial. The other big problem is, since they all have the same system, that epigenetic system had to have been there from the beginning, so to speak. Okay, so all these organisms from the ones, that, starting from bacteria back here at the beginning, and evolving all these organisms through time, they all have that same system. That system had to have been there from the very beginning when all you had was bacteria, okay? Um, is that anywhere near realistic? And <clears throat> that sophisticated system had to evolve at the very beginning, an adequate system to manage the net genetic systems of fish, reptiles, mammals, and human concert violinists, okay? It had to be sufficient to manage the genetic information of all these different organisms millions of years before they evolved, when all there was was bacteria. Okay, that's, that's the double whammy uh, that this has for, for evolution. Um, is that anywhere near uh, realistic? Okay, what's a creationist interpretation? What's really going on here? And I would suggest this. The creator designed a genetic epigenetic system sufficient to manage and foster animal and plant adaptation to changing environments. So we are made with the abil ability to adapt, to change, and to, to respond to the environment. And the environment can induce uh, beneficial changes. <coughs> now, of course, we live in a sin-damaged world, and so the things that, that happen, like this, the stuff that Audrey Hepburn had to put up with, I mean, that doesn't always come out very good <coughs> because <coughs> we're adapting to very difficult conditions. And yet, uh, uh, I would suggest that originally it was a very effective system to allow us to, to adapt to modification, to changes in, 
in this original world uh, as we moved around the world and, and adapted. <coughs> so there is plenty of evidence for microevolution and speciation. That, that part is, is solid. It's how it works. You know, we're, we're learning more about the process. But how about macroevolution? This is um, macroevolution are the bigger changes. And we look at it in the big scale of things. Um, what does epigenetics say about that? And here's my conclusion. Epigenetics and the demise of junk DNA are coming as a karate chop across the dreary, broader Darwinian worldview. That's my conclusion. <coughs> I think it's a very, these are very significant findings and uh, they're going to multiply in, in the, the effect that they have on our understanding. Well, um, how do these folks approach the fact that environmental changes are random? They can't design complex structures. Have they addressed that question? Uh, the, they're, to some extent, they're recognizing that, you, that it, what you're saying is you can't design complex structures with random changes. And so they start, so they use the epigenetic system. What they're not dealing with is how do you get the epigenetic system? Okay, but uh, uh, you're not going to design an eye uh, by just, uh, you know, random changes in the environment. I don't. Uh, well, one response is, isn't it amazing what evolution can do? <laughs> they're, not, they're not asking, how can this happen? <coughs> If you, if you start out with a, with a worldview that, that demands naturalism, you're not asking, could this happen? You, you know mm -hmm. it happened. We're here, therefore it happened. And so mm -hmm. you're, you're only trying to figure out exactly how it happens. You're only, uh, the, the theory trumps mm -hmm. evidence, and all you're doing is trying to understand the details of how it happened. And they're not addressing that question, yeah. as far as I can see. A second question I'd have is, uh, have they addressed the endurance of the thing? Uh, we have three or four generations, uh, uh, good examples of that. Uh, if it doesn't last, uh, this is not gonna help evolution. Yeah, well, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I've seen a statement in at least one of these books that it can, these can persist for many generations. And their extended synthesis proposes that you have these epigenetic changes then they get kind of um, somehow fitted into the genetic system. So they, they result in genetic changes, which then are permanent. Now that, that's their theory they're proposing. Uh, I don't think they even claim to know how it works. This, this is their theory. Okay. Uh, I've got a couple of questions. Uh, one is, are the epigenetic changes, are, are they adaptive? Do they improve the, the lot of the organism, such as improving survivability? Apparently so. That, that's what is, what is believed. So, uh, well, let me ask you this. Let's say, for example, if somebody chooses to, to drink alcohol and becomes addicted, et cetera, and passes on those genes to the next generation, would we expect that that would uh, confer a survival advantage to the no, next? No, um, that's, that's a negative environment factor that, that, that has a negative effect on the next generation. But factors that, that are not negative apparently can, they, they can, um, well, for instance, take those salamanders, okay, somehow, they, they adjust, depending on where they live, what kind of environment, what kind of life cycle they have. It adjusts when they have these gills and when they don't. So that's an adaptive um, change. So some ed epigenetic <coughs> changes are, are good and some are bad. Yeah, depends on the conditions on the, that are affecting the organism. Um, so if, uh, if Horses can can go through that dramatic of, of changes uh, through epigenetics. Then could we have 
horses, modern horses today, place them in, in a, a um, I don't know, forested or swamp, swamp sort of environment, mm -hmm. uh, and in a few generations, maybe one or two generations, uh, have, you know, four, four toed horses? Mm -hmm. I, I don't have evidence to answer that question, but I, um, I think it wouldn't happen that fast. I'm just guessing here. I don't think it would happen that fast. And it may be that as creatures kind of a, um, adapt maybe through time and they get more specialized, it's possible they, they lose some of that adaptability. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Reflecting your comments, this uh, month's issue of Discovery has an article on the rapidity of evolutionary change. Mm -hmm. They have recognized these changes that you're talking about, but it's not epigenetics. It's rapid mm -hmm. evolution. Yeah, that's right, and that, that is a trend. And this is another thing that's changing. Um, it used to be thought that evolution of a new species or of any significant change takes thousands, millions of years. Well, now evolutionary biologists recognizing th recognize that no that's not true it happens very fast in a few years in the in the lifetime of a research grant these changes can occur <laughs> so. and that that's a very significant cha uh, change in thinking as well and that again fits what we've creationists have been saying for decades that the changes that do happen can happen fast but these big changes don't happen yeah, they're, 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 um, that change in thinking doesn't oppose their evolutionary belief, and so ex they accept that. See, I don't know who's next here. Yeah, I just wanted to ask about uh, current epigenetic studies. Um, what type of current epigenetic studies are being done? I j and aside from that, I wanted to make the comment that each one of us probably live in a different micro environmental condition depending on the food we eat and the habits we, we live in. So there must be some epigenetic uh, eff uh, effects that will affect our health farther ahead. And therefore the question, what type of epigenetic studies are being done? That okay. might be useful for our health, for learning more about um, what, what it can do. To your second question, it's very true. What we eat and how we live will affect our health and our children's health. That's very true. As to what's being done, this is a vast field and I couldn't even, I really couldn't answer your question. There's just uh, an enormous amount of research that is being done. Our thoughts affect our Epigenetics, yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> um, might uh, macro changes through epigenetics, you know, like like the the gills and and, mm -hmm. and tails, uh, could this provide a mechanism for a couple of things? Rapid uh, major speciation of animals after the flood, uh, as well as um, macro changes that wouldn't require death in a in a in a good environment like, like uh, an Eden type environment? I, th I think the answer is yes to both those. Uh, there are many reasons from looking at the fossils and other you know, life we have on this earth. A lot of reasons for thinking there must have been quite rapid diversification and, and, and speciation after the flood. And so, um, yeah, I think that this is theoretical, but we think that would be true. And it would provide uh, for the, the changes and what are the limits of the change? And that's what some of our creationists are trying to understand from the evidence, how much change really does occur. And we don't know the answer to that, for um, sure. Also, if you start with a few species uh, extending from Noah's Ark, they're going to be going into biomes that are not filled with other, you know, with competing Creatures. That would be ideal conditions for rapid speciation and diversification. That combined with epigenetics could, could right. see pretty dramatic changes in a very short period of time. Yes. Okay. And, and how much change can occur? You know, 
We really don't know the answer for sure. It, it's, uh, the Bible makes it clear that there's a, a, a diversity of creatures at the end of creation week. Uh, reptiles, mammals, birds, uh, humans, fruit trees, which are thought to be the most highly evolved. So the, the big, the big uh, you know, major macroevolution did not happen. But what were the limits? Well, we're not sure. I mean, you have, um, the, there are um, whales, there are baleen whales and toothed whales. But as an embryo, they can have both. And there's a fossil that looks like it had both. Okay, so were, were baleen whales and, and toothed whales created separate? Or were the whales made with the potential to go either way? You know, those are interesting questions. Um, that seem to be within the realm of, of what might be real. And we don't know exactly what those limits are. Go ahead. Just start talking. Just start talking. Yeah, okay. Um, what I was wondering, it seems like all uh, the editing the epigenetics all seem to be dealing with uh, an imperfect situation. It seems to me like this is maybe a way to uh, partially correct for, you might say, the curse of sin and the changes that brought. What would happen if we could eliminate, uh, we don't need the ed editing devices. We don't need the uh, epigenetics to make some of these changes we now need to make. Uh, does that have something to do with a uh, man living 900 years instead of 70, 80 now? Um, and it doesn't seem to have anything to do with uh, a particular kind of creature we're talking about, you know, dogs and cats and that sort of thing. Well, okay, maybe I, I suggest we're, t we're dealing with two different aspects of things. Yeah, that's where I'm... One is you have the original creation, which for, for some reason was apparently not subjected to mutation. Mutations do occur. They do a lot of damage. Yeah. Uh, geneticists tell us that our the human genome is degrading from 1% to 6% per generation, producing all this cancer and everything. Yeah, okay, this so, is where I'm fine. Yeah, you got mutational change, which is damaging. But how much epigenetic change do we need in a perfect world? Well, we can only guess. But, um, but creatures perhaps needed to adapt. Their, their conditions might have been different around the earth and they needed to adapt. And, but you didn't have, wouldn't, I would suggest, you didn't have the, the negative things that, that come about now because of the, uh, the problems in our world. Ariel? <laughs> uh, just uh, wondering about, uh, you know, we, we've got, uh, we're discovering that uh, whales, for instance, can grow uh, legs. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, uh, <coughs> you know, a few rare exceptions where you find some whales and they've got legs on them. Uh, I've seen pictures of these. Uh, dolphins will develop. Uh, uh, where these legs are supposed to be, they'll develop some irregular masses that have bones and muscles in them and so on. That some uh, Dolphins have the genes there to, to produce these things, and when these are not controlled, they, 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 these are active. There's a basic pattern here in, in vertebrates, I think, that uh, have legs. Mm -hmm. And if you can uh, create a dolphin, instead of going to the whole new system, just turn off the leg system and you've got a dolphin. Well, it takes a little more, a lot more than that. Uh, so uh, uh, when you got into this uh, salamander thing, uh, I, I kept wondering if possibly that might be involved in the thing, but uh, as an aside to this and a complication to it, I would say that it seems to me that organisms have been created to a certain degree of built-in adaptation mm -hmm. to permit them to survive. And it is a good thing that this can happen or life would not be so persistent on this earth, uh, per se. But uh, I wonder if the picture is going to be much more complex than uh, just epigenetics versus ordinary genetics, uh, in that uh, we have 
purposeful design, and we have what might be interpreted as epigenetics, which is actually just turning off original systems that were intended to be turned off that are still there. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I think you're on the right track. Um, it does look like like uh, the whole whale group has the genetics for, for rear legs that just are made to be non-functional. But modifications you know, can, can turn those on in unusual yeah. situations. In fact, in, in uh, uh, por porpoises, embryonic porpoises, they will develop a bud where the uh, legs are supposed to develop as uh, other vertebrates do and then the buds disappear. Mm -hmm. you, you can see the actual system of repression yeah. there, which mm -hmm. is very interesting. Mm -hmm. So along when um, the movie Artificial Intelligence came out, so I don't know if anybody's seen that, but it got me thinking on this stuff, that God had to come up with a system that were enough alike where we're not going to be afraid of each other and we can trust each other, but yet if we're not unique, then we can't trust that God loves us because why would he love me versus you unless I'm different so so that we have to be unique and so epigenetics is the the solution so just like twins you know the exact same genes and yet there's still differences uh, take the most disparate person uh, in, two people in the world and and it's their 99.99 percent the same right mm -hmm. DNA wise so it's one base in a thousand base pairs that are different so um, so it doesn't so DNA doesn't explain all the differences it's all the stuff that happens after uh, DNA and so that's so we need that to be unique and uh, so, so it's to me a natural it was a, it's a it's a elegant system so so and what decides how much change is possible yeah, so um, I'd just suggest that it, it simply is how much variability did God put in the system, the genetic system of each group? And I think I might have talked to you once before about, about this. Dogs have obvious tremendous possibility of variation, you know, from little, little creatures that, are, that a wolf would be ashamed of, you know, to claim in his family to, to wolf-like creatures. Well, cats simply don't have that. So I suggest that in each group, God gave them a certain range of possible variation. And evolution can happen within that range, but, but not, not beyond it. Yeah, a dog doesn't become a cat, no. <laughs> you know, when you change various things, uh -huh. uh, nor vice versa. But, but it raises an interesting question, uh, this epigenetic issue is, what happened at the time of sin, the original sin? Clearly something very dramatic occurred what if there were a whole number of switches that were suddenly turned mm -hmm. and thus we no longer functioned the way we did before sin mm -hmm. we now were adapted to the circumstances of sin mm -hmm. yes you mm -hmm. know this is a fascinating mm -hmm. problem um, and it also raises another question is how we will we be changed in the twinkling of an eye from what we are like now to what we shall be? Yeah, that's a very interesting thing, but clearly God knows what needs healing and what needs repair, what mm -hmm. needs servicing in order to bring it in optimal function. Mm -hmm. The Bible says he knows that he's numbered the hairs of our head. If that statement was, was made now, he'd probably say, well, he knows our genotype and our phenotype and our epigenetic Everything. features. <laughs> so, so to me, the question would be, what effect does going from trust to distrust have on this whole system? Mm -hmm. To me, it would be a natural consequence. God doesn't have to monkey with it. It's, it's inherent in the, way, in the relationship. So that would be, the, to me, the question of, uh, yeah, to I, the I degree like that. that our thoughts influence this. Yeah, I like that. So it, well, God didn't arbitrarily turn off those right. switches. There, there's some real effect of yeah. feeling alone and distrustful and, mm -hmm. and those kinds of yeah. feelings. 
Dr. Brand, have you posed your, your critique of their theory to the authors of this theory? No. No. <laughs> okay. Have you published this yet? Well, um, Art Chadwick and I are working on a third edition of the book, Faith, Reason, and Earth History, and, and this is in there. Thank you. Uh, your thoughts um, are well articulated, I think, in that book, The God-Shaped Brain. And so I, I agree with you. It's a tremendous uh, neural pathway and tremendous changes that occur based on our environment and how we respond to it and what we put into our brain. So if people are interested in a continuation of your thought, I would recommend you take a look at the God-Shaped Brain book. Hmm. God-Shaped Brain book. I would encourage you to look because that basically articulates and gives research data behind your comment. The God-Shaped Brain. That's an interesting I think it's Jennings. He's one of the authors in the, that compilation from the Loma Linda Press on um, Servant God. He's one of the authors in there, and he wrote the book, The God-Shaped Brain. And it, it's interesting to see how some of the um, data over the last 10 to 15 years has backed up that what we put in our brain actually changes our neural pathways and changes in, in how things happen to other generations, et cetera. The brain that changes itself, too, like doage. Right. Hmm. The brain that changes itself. That sounds interesting. Doage? Okay. One, just a, a little humorous thing here. The, the two main um, books that are proposing this new theory, one of them is, is a, the guy is named Cabbage, pronounced almost like cabbage. The other one is like Pigliucci. I can just imagine the, the jokes going around among certain traditional <coughs> Darwinists about this cabbage head and, and you know, pig headed and you know, whatever. <laughs> one of the most fascinating things to me to believe in a creator is the power of choice he has given us. Power of choice. Power of choice. Um, in the scriptures, uh, early in the scriptures, I think it's in the Genesis Exodus where it says, the consequences of the choices of the parents, I get it on the children, mm -hmm. third or fourth. This is amazing. But the, the ones who love me, mm -hmm. for generations I bless their children. It's beautiful. It comes <coughs> together so well. Yeah. Who knew about genetics and epigenetics at <laughs> that time? Beautiful. God did. Yes, of course he did. <laughs> Are these uh, authors of, uh, who are advocating epigenetics of those last four books you mentioned, uh, are they saying Lamarckism is dead? Are they a little more cautious? No, they actually recognize that okay. epigenetics looks like Lamarckianism. And what, what they do try to do is try to sort of downplay that and make it look like, no, this is not heresy, it's okay. But, but they haven't, I don't think, really succeeded in that. <laughs> <laughs> Would you advise us on what, of these books that you put on the screen, uh, which of those is perhaps uh, most recent and most helpful in presenting? This is such well, a fascinating new field. Yeah. Uh, some of those are, are pretty, pretty heavy reading. Uh, the one by Shapiro I'd, I'd recommend. Uh, and also there are other books on on Have epigenetics, I'm which I didn't put up there, uh, some of them were, were, were given in the announcement for this. There was uh, an early book by Tom Woodward and Gillies, yes, but that's, that's only about, what, seven years all out of date. That's all right, but it's not, it's not really, I mean, it doesn't get into all the details, but it's still a good book. And there's one by, by Francis that, I, that was in the announcement. That book by Cabbage looked like a, an intimidating Yes. It's a very large book. Yes, and it, it is. And you are not endorsing that one particularly. Well, that's not the one to start with. <laughs> I, an issue close to home, the, the, the human body. In my lifetime, not in yours, but in mine, there have been clear changes in the average height of the, the human male, for example. Our... Our children are, are bigger usually than our own, than we were. Mm -hmm. Has this issue 
to your knowledge, been addressed uh, as an epigenetic thing in response to our environment? I, I don't know if it's being described as epigenetic. Certainly it's, well, if you look, um, take the, the length lifespans of the patriarchs after the flood, and you plot those on a graph. It's, it's a biological decay curve. It cries right down. But then it's the lake, the life, seems to level off, and it's affected primarily by nutrition and, and um, that sort of thing after that. And I think that's well understood. I, don't, I haven't been reading into that. Well, you're talking there about lifespan. That's yes. that's longevity. Right. Uh, I was yeah, well, interested uh, in the height, actual size. I wonder height, if is, height as well. I think it's being described as being influenced by those factors, what we eat and what. I mean, the, I remember one book. It talked about about this very factor, uh, saying that the, you know, a, a parental couple from Asia, uh, you know, five foot three, uh, they come over here and and now. Um, number one son is six foot two and, and is on is a, uh, We've got a, a Chinese team. player who's seven feet six or something. Yeah. Okay, th this is what's happened to the human for my, race. For my reading, those are those are understood as being from nutrition and other things. One single man has benefited from nutrition. I want to know what he ate. <laughs> yeah. Veggie burger. Maybe not, I don't know. <laughs> I would recommend the book Mind, Character, and Personality by Ellen G. White. Uh -huh. She was up to date. Uh -huh. I'll also tell you about a man that was, he was the cause of my becoming an Adventist. He r owned a gymnasium and was a marvelous physical specimen, Mr. Colorado, Mr. Mm -hmm. California, Mr. Mm -hmm. USA. He was special. Mm -hmm. But he wanted to run the Pikes Peak Marathon. He would take his weight down to about 130 pounds and run the race and win it. Uh, Every year he ran uh, it, he won. Uh -huh. Then after the race, because he was a muscle man, he would go up to 210. Uh in a short time. Uh. He, con he controlled his body. It wasn't uh, any magic. It was the foods he ate and the mm -hmm. kinds of exercise he did. But there's a God-given control. Mm -hmm. hmm. Well, um, <coughs> it looks like we've uh, come to a fairly convenient place to call it quits for today. Um, thank you, Dr. Brand, for your presentation. I'm sure we all learned something about um, uh, epigenetics, even though some of us may not have learned very much. Um, and uh, we appreciate getting a review of that kind. Uh, next week, we will be talking about Eugene Coonan and the origin of life. And somebody finally did a statistical analysis of the RNA world. And uh, using very highly optimistic uh, estimates, uh, it still comes out extremely improbable. And uh, you'll get to see the statistics uh, this next uh, week. Uh, I think you'll be interested in it. Um, down the pike, I'm going to discuss um, uh, prior probabilities and the God hypothesis, uh, which actually has to do with next week's talk. And um, uh, there are a couple of other things that are uh, uh, still, uh, I think, interesting that before we uh, resume our usual uh, review of uh, uh, the book Biological Information, which will probably deal with uh, Behe's chapter next, uh, the next time we come back to it. Anyway, welcome. Um, I will be sending out an email d uh, describing when all that happens, so uh, uh, those of you who get the email can be informed. Those of you who don't, uh, 
feel free to let me know what your address is and we'll be happy to add you to the list. Again, thank you very much, Dr. Brandt.